So welcome to another edition of the Brazil Shirt Name podcast. He is the legendino, Tim Vickery. And he is the king of nighttime radio, daytime radio, Jewish holidays, uptown, up, uptown nights. He'll do whatever you want him to do. Mr. Dot Nadabayu. Happy Hanukkah. So uh, we welcome another member of the gang, the wider Brazilian shirt name uh, podcast gang to our midst this time around, Tim. Uh, do, do you want to introduce him? Because you've met him in the flesh, is it? Yeah, I, I met him uh, in the uh, in the very, very tall flesh. Um, more than it's six and a half years ago now. Is that and is that correct grammar? Tall flesh? In the very, very, very tall. Well, it's the kind of grammar that Donald Trump uses, so go for it, yeah. Uh, it'll do for now. Uh, and um, I can tell you that since then, in the subsequent six and a half years, uh, Mark Gleason has turned into the wily old silvery old fox uh, that he wasn't in January, February of 2014. He's a he's a he's, he's a white haired uh, veteran now of, of, of all that is wisdom. And I'm delighted that we can welcome him to this podcast. Hello, Mark. How are you, mate? I'm very well, thanks. Isn't it in your in your speakers? Shouldn't that be a geezer? That's all about geezer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Could be a very very grey fox, thanks. white haired geezer. I'm sorry to stress the grey hair, by the way, but he started it. Yeah, I've had the. I, I mean, I've had the grey hair for a very long time. I'm a bit surprised that he thinks I'm greyer than I was before. I'm a bit concerned, actually. But um, I would. I wouldn't yeah. actually say greyer, Mark. I would go. I'll go more for whiter. Oh, white. Well, maybe, so. Yeah, maybe you were grey then and white now. Yeah, yeah. But the interesting grey in hair colour, I might add, not in personality. Let's, let's quickly never, yes. never. And and apologies for being pedantic. Um, but as we await the results of the presidential election stateside, I think it's safe to assume that the English language, correctly spoken, will survive for at least another president's presidential term. But hair never goes grey. It, it never goes grey. It's either white or whatever the colour of your hair was. You know, it, there's a process. So when you say grey hair, what you're saying is that there isn't enough, enough strength in depth of white hair. So we'll call it grey for now. But actually, it's just white or black or brown or whatever. It you is. are destroying no, no. my entire discourse with my stepdaughters. That was I, I, like, I like to line them up. And point to the odd grey hair and say, "This one and this one and this one were you. Odd, odd grey hair. This one, this one, this one were you." Now there's quite, a, there's quite a lot yeah. there. Yeah, let's, 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 let's get that grammatically correct too, please. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it is. You don't know how infuriating it is, Mark, to have <laughs> one of the somebody from the colonies correcting our language. It is somewhat infuriating. Whether you're American or South African, it makes no difference. I'm not sure if the world allows people from the colonies to be correcting <laughs> an Englishman. Whichever way we speak is the correct way, whether you're Cockney or not. All right. Okay. Um, I, and, I and, stand correct. Interesting that today, though, that we convene, and by the way, um, I should tell everybody, in case you don't know, that Mr. Gleason also has a Brazilian shirt name. Uh, it's one of the best. Springbok Jr. <laughs> Welcome, as always. Now, of all the days to have the Oracle of African football with us, Tim, um, when we've seen the last few days of uh, madness going on, sheer madness going on in Nigeria, where, uh, well officials or whether they be police or army are shooting uh, their own civilians and it has taken <clears throat> to my surprise um perhaps um uh, ooh, how should i put this to my surprise but yet to the um esteem with which i hold Nigerian footballers, it has taken one of them at least to come out and speak out against the government and the way that the government is shaming the country around the world. And that was Odia Nidalo of Manchester United. I must say, I don't know if you heard what he said, Mark, about the shootings uh, this week in Nigeria, but I, I thought it was quite forthright for, from him. And I'm not sure that I've ever experienced a Nigerian footballer standing up so immediately strong against the the government no indeed there's uh, you can you can look across the, the entire continent there's not many 
um, Nigerians, Cameroonians, Ghanaians, Kenyans, etc., who've said much against the I think the only one off the top of my head is Mohammed Abu Trika, who um, is, uh, of course, in exile in Qatar, the, the Egyptian, because he, he was uh, he was quite forceful in his um, condemnation of the military regime that they have there now in Egypt. But he's also been uh, uh, allegedly um, associated with the Muslim Brotherhood, and that's why they've uh, sort of kicked him out of Egypt and he's in exile in Qatar. But he's, made it, he's, he, he's been really the only overtly political African footballer of any profile that I can think of in the last uh, decade or so. So, yeah, what, what Igalo did, uh, I think, is... Uh, is uh, very brave. A B hopefully uh, becomes a bit of a, a trend-setting um, thing for African footballers because there's lots to complain about on this continent, and lots to be said, and they have the profile, and I think they have the following uh, these days. They, they speak to the youth. They can be very, very effective. And it really underlines the point that uh, just 24 years ago in August, 24 years ago in August, at the Nigerian football team represented not just its country, but arguably the entire continent of Africa in, in winning um, an international tournament. Well, when I say international, beyond the borders of the African continent uh, tournament and being the first team to do it in the Olympic Games. Yeah, that was magnificent. I was there that day. It was actually in Athens, Georgia, as opposed to Atlanta, Georgia. It was quite, it was quite a bus ride out from the city to... Uh, to, uh, to go and watch, but a magnificent stadium, one of those concrete American gridiron edifices. It was uh, absolutely huge, packed to the rafters, and um, a magnificent performance, A, against Argentina, and then against Brazil, or was it the other way around? I can't remember. Um, but, um, I mean, just such a such an exciting time for African football, and such an exciting squad, you know, many th those names still resonate, Kocha and Olise and Kanu, etc. They still remain amongst the legends of the of the African game. It was Argentina, sorry, it was Brazil, then Argentina, wasn't it, Tim? That's right, yeah, Brazil in the, in the semi-final, and then Argentina in the final. And it was terrific. This is a big tournament for, for me, because this... I was, I was already in Brazil by this time. And uh, I remember hanging around the, the building of the Brazilian FA in about 95. And I got my hands on one of those documents, you know, that FIFA does after major tournaments. And this was the, the FIFA report on the 1994 World Cup. And one of the things that they had in it was previous international tournaments that, that players had played in. And I had a look and I look at the final. The final was Italy and Brazil. And over half the players who played in that final had come up through previous Olympic campaigns, either 88 or 92. And that was a real eye-opener for me because obviously, you know, in, in Britain, we'd never taken the, the Olympic football tournament seriously at all. And it's, it struck me that we were missing out, that it was a really interesting halfway house on the rope, route to the World Cup. It's been somewhat emasculated now, I think, the Olympic football tournament by the fact that there is no obligation anymore on the clubs to release players. But there was an obligation back then. And uh, from a Brazil point of view, they thought they just won the World Cup in 94. So their confidence was really flying. They thought they had a great generation that were going to stroll to France 98. And the Olympics was their kind of preparation ground. So it was, it was a hugely important tournament. So it was uh, by far and away the, the most important thing about the 1996 Olympics in Brazil or in Argentina because it's football, it's what they do best. And uh, the Brazil side, it was a great game against Nigeria in the semi-final, where Brazil should have had it in the bag because it was a Nigerian side that attacked much better than it defended. But Brazil collapsed later on. And that had huge consequences because Brazil then thought, they got themselves in a state of mind where, oh God, we're not as good as we thought we were. We're, we're a little bit rudderless. We, we need the big leader. We need to bring the leader back. And that's where Dunga got back into the side in the build-up to, to France 98. But they'd already decided that Dunga was too old to play. So they got themselves into a mental state where they couldn't play with Dunga and couldn't play without him. And it really, I made my name saying on the road to, uh, to Brazil, uh, to France 98, forget all the airport lounge adverts, great as they are, Brazil are a flawed side and I can't see them winning it. Argentina 
had a really good generation coming through. I was in Argentina at the start of this year, at the start of 96, and I watched their under-23 side preparing. And you could see there was real talent there. There's one name missing from this team sheet that, that, that played Nigeria, and that's Veron, who struck me as the best one when I saw them in, in January of, of, of that year. But he was a little bit of a wild child at the time, and that was a big, that was a big subject in Argentine football. The coach was Passarella. Now, Passarella had been a player in 86 where the Maradona generation were taking over. And Passarella fought tooth and nail with the Maradona generation over aspects of their behaviour, especially the drug taking. And the, he was saying that you're getting out of line. And in the end, he was kind of proved right when Maradona failed the drug test in 1994 and so on. So he took over as coach and he wanted to clean them up. So short hair, for example, you couldn't play for Argentina if you if you had long hair. You know, it, it, it was all a kind of rebrand of Argentina. Let's get the druggies out. Let's get the, the ill-disciplined ones out. And that, although, although Veron didn't have long hair, he had the he was a pioneer of the shaven-headed look. He was a little bit of a wild child. So they didn't take him to the Olympics, but it was still a very, very good side, beaten by an even better Nigeria side on the day. And what just going, just going back to that, which they were. Sorry to interrupt you, but just going back to that Brazilian side, was it not was it not a uh, a unique um, decision by the CBF uh, in the nine or, or months before, maybe even the twelve months before the tournament, to use all of the all of the Brazilian matches with an under twenty three side? So in other words, they were getting full international caps. It was being uh, it was being regarded as an international, but they were only using the under twenty threes in that time and Zagalo was brought back as the coach. That's right. That's uh, it, it was the Olympics as the halfway house. Cause remember in those days, the world cup holders didn't have to qualify. So they're already in France 98. So the Olympics is, it's the competitive games that they have. Um, the, the cop America of 97 was, was a joke competition that uh, more or less everyone sent reserve sides to. So th th that was what they had in order to, to prepare, prepare their team. And there was, there was, what, a, there was I, a... what I remember about that was that that Brazilian team came to uh, came to South Africa in uh, March of '96. So that's around about four months ahead of the Olympics, or only six months ahead of the Olympics. Not um, a vuvuzela in sight. No, not in those days. Um, the Chinese had not invented them yet. Um, <laughs> and and what happened was that um, it was South Africa's first game after winning the Africa Cup of Nations. So you can imagine the euphoria in the mm. country. You know absolute uh, bedlam in terms of our newfound position as African champions and uh, we were we were also well on our way to qualifying for France we were leading the group at that stage and uh, we had a prestige friendly against Brazil and we were leading gotten 2-0 at half time against the mighty Brazil all the mighty Brazilian under 23s but but who you know, who was the coach because he was he was giving it all the north yeah he was he, he, his name was Clive Barker he was very famous for uh, a celebration that he had where he stretched his arms out and he, yes. would, he would fly he started that already uh, a couple of years before and um he shouldn't he have done it that day oh no, really, he did it on both occasions it. i remember that very vividly he did it on both occasions he sort of flew around the field um, and, uh, and, and this, uh, Zaglo was absolutely furious at this. He, he, he saw it as a real, uh, a real, not a snub, but, uh, you know, it's, it's something, something not to be done on the football field. And so when Brazil fought back in the second half and they, they won by three goals to two, Zaglo set off on one of these little, um, flies of his own. And I think he kept that celebration up as well, uh, further on, um, for Brazil, so that's a little bit of uh, South African input into into uh, Brazilian football culture. Hopefully, it didn't last very long. Where well, did I, where did the Nigeria team come from? Well, it came from Vesterhof and the '94 side that won uh, that won in Tunisia. You know, the uh, um, it, it was also the beginning, the genesis of of, of Nigerians moving across um, to to uh, to Europe. Um, but that 94, I mean, they were African champions already. I mean, there was a, a quality team. Keshi was on his way out. Um, and they had, uh, you know, they, they had didn't have much success at the 94 World Cup in the USA. Westerhoff left. His Dutch uh, assistant, Joe Bonfrey, took over from him. And, but, the, the, you know, the, the key players are all pretty much the same. 
uh, Olise, um, Okoche in particular. And then, of course, this exciting youngster, Kanu, who just missed out on the uh, 94 uh, team, was then incorporated into the side. I think he made his debut in, the, in that Intercontinental Cup that they had in 95, uh, I think still in those days in Saudi Arabia. So, um, no, it, was, it, 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 it was a well-established team. It's not as if that Nigerian side came out of nowhere. And, and, and many of those players were now breaking through from the youth level, being picked up by clubs in Europe. Baba Yara was a good example, the, the, the fullback from Anderlecht. Um, and so um, you had some real quality on the pitch there. Um, and, 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 I mean, to this day, it's, it's for Nigerians, that's the golden generation. You know, you mention those names and the... You know, people start purring. It's uh, it, it, it's unfortunately for them because I think that, you know they should have kicked on as a such a big nation with so much that's, quality. That, but, that's the uh, big thing, isn't it? The, the big disappointment for me was them in 1998. Yeah, in 98 or they, in 98 that that side should have really been peaking, and they did really poorly. But it, I mean, even now in uh, in Russia, you know, I mean that that Nigerian team on paper. Uh, looks a quarter-final side, particularly when you consider Denmark and Croatia and, and those kind of countries making it into, into the last eight. You know, Nigeria, with its massive population, with a huge store of footballers all across the world, backing to get out of the first round, it's, it's, it's actually not acceptable as far as African football aficionados are concerned. Mm. But the Nigerian football team, national team, and also even at a sort of local level, um, they are so dependent... Um, upon the moment rather than upon the history of, you know, uh, taking part in tournaments, you know, the, whatever it is that you have as a result of that tradition being part of your football system. And don't forget as well, in, in Nigeria at the time, we had a, a, a military government, perhaps the most brutal military government um, of uh, since independence, which is... Uh, the military government of Sani um, Abacha, and um, I don't think he was bothered about the football that much. At least, I, I don't know, you could correct me on, on this, um, Mark. No, he, he, he wasn't. I mean, in, in 96, because Mandela called him out when he executed uh, Sarawira, the, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing it. Yeah, uh, in Sarawira. When he, when he executed him, which is what he really did, I mean, it was a judicial farce, um, Mandela called him out on that, and he and he withdrew the Nigerian side from the Cup of Nations. So that 96... Which was in South Africa, wasn't it? Which was yeah. in South Africa. It was, it was his little revenge on, on Mandela. Nigeria were the, were, the, were the marquee side. They were the reigning champions. They were going off the Olympics. They'd just come from the World Cup in the USA. I mean, that's, you know, if you really want to be picky, that South African, value, that South African um, success in 96 is devalued by the fact Nigeria didn't participate in that tournament and if you looked at it on paper before the tournament Nigeria were the favorites and 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 the quality of their side they probably would have won although we had the the home factor in our favor and we had a very good team as as it turned out but uh that that victory is a little bit devalued by Nigeria's absence and that is purely because of a butcher's petulance uh and because Mandela called him out on on, on that execution and his revenge was to was to stop the team from traveling yeah, 3rd of August 1996 is the date we're looking at uh, where Nigeria beat Argentina to win the gold in the Olympic Games. Uh, Mark, any idea what was number one in the pop charts in the UK at this time? In 96 in August? Uh, yeah, I have no idea at all. Oh, so you weren't listening to the top 40 can you, give us a, can you give us a little bit of a... Uh, of a hint because it'd be, it'd be a good challenge. Well, let me put it this way. It was one small step for man, but it was a whole load of steps um, on stage for women um, and spicy women. Ah, uh, okay. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's something I'm not qualified to talk about. Spice Girls, <laughs> stock titles. <laughs> I, I, I proudly can tell you I have absolutely no idea. Ah, not well, a single you... one, not a single one. Well, not, not this, single this, one. this was the one. I think it was their first one, and it, it took over the world. And I was, I was back in it in 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 England in in May, and I remember staying at a mate's house, and he had, he had all these kind of musical channels, and the cheapest one of the lot had this group appearing every five minutes, and it just seemed so desperate, and they were plugging this song, and I uh, and I thought there is no way. There is no way that this is ever going to be a success. It is the definitive moment when I realised that I was old and I was out of touch with uh, with with what, what what young I was thirty one. I was out of touch with because uh, the phrase, "I'll tell you what I want, what I really really want," 
it just became absolutely ubiquitous. Uh, probably its proudest moment is we're at the fag end of the John Major Tory regime. And I think one of his ministers said something like, I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. I want a lower public services borrowing requirement. Uh, yes. That's the wrong lyric. No, that's it, what it, I what, want. What he really wants, what it's he really, remix. really wants is your ziggy, 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 ziggy. Ah. <laughs> So you, you, you're, you're following us on this, Mark? Um, keep up, keep up. Reluctantly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had to write that stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Come on. And as, as Tim says, it took over the world. Everybody was saying, I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but it's not because of age that we are out of the loop. Well, Tim is self-confessed out of the loop on this. It's because, Tim, you haven't realised in all your years of following music, it ain't about the song. It's about the package. You know, Elvis Presley, do you think that Elvis Presley would be would have gone to number one with his first you know, university or nationally released single if he was a big, fat black guy from the Deep South moaning about Heartbreak Hotel? Do you, do you honestly think so? No, but he could do it if he was a big, fat white guy like Bill Haley. <laughs> let me just yeah me, yeah it, yeah no there's no yeah a kiss no, and there's just, another there's another thing on that same theme is rolling stone magazine i read it for the first time in years the other day had its best uh 500 albums of all time revisited and republished with a new list and of course the the longtime favorite was abbey road by the beatles i think it'd be been top of many, many polls, but including Rolling Stones. And, and the new number one is Marvin Gaye. Yeah. Um, and I, I downloaded it um, on my uh, download service. So I won't plug anybody here. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure it's the best album of all time. I've got to be honest with you. It's, it's not bad. Which one? What, um, what's what's going, going on? on? What's going on? Yeah. Ooh, yeah. Oh, it's yeah, a couple a of nice one, tunes, a couple of nice tunes, a lot of strings, a lot of uh, decent one. bass, but world's best album of all time. Mm -hmm. is, it because, is it because Marvin Gaye is sort of a, a dead icon? And a very cool looking dead icon because Absolutely. going back to what Tim was saying, um, Bill Haley, it's great, just like it's a you, great trench coat on the cover. Amazing. And, 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 and what a sharp uh, coiffure of his beard as well. But um, just like you were here on at this match, Mark, you were there live and direct to see Nigeria win the Olympic gold. I was there live and direct to see Bill Haley when I was about 12 years old and, and thought I was a teddy boy at the um, Mecca in Stevenage. Uh, so this would have been about in the mid 70s or so. And what I remember of him was he, he was podgy, but I wouldn't have called him fat, Tim. That's you know, unfortunate, unhelpful, slightly disrespectful to the person who, you know, serendipitously kicked off the whole rock and roll thing no, in the no, UK I, with I, I, uh, Rock I'll take Around you the back. No, 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 no need to take it back. back. I was just being more accurate. You know, we're sticking to the correct grammar. We may as well stick to the uh, correct maths as well in terms of weight and kilograms, etc. But what was number two in the charts might be of more interest to you Mark, um, number two in the UK pop charts on this day, the 3rd of August, 1996. Uh, Killing Me Softly, The Fugees, you remember that? One time. Yeah. Ah, so we're back on... That Lauren, what's her, what's her name? Lauren... Uh, <laughs> what's her name? Hill. Hill, Hill, Hill. There we go. Yeah, and... You know, you know, some, you know sometimes, Dot, and we, we, we talk about the, you know, the top ten and so on, are not being particularly culturally important by this time. I think this particular top 10 is different because there, there, are, there are a couple of things there that just leap out for me as being hugely culturally significant of the time. I don't, I don't, I don't get them myself at all. They mean nothing to me. But one thing that really struck me coming back at that time was just like drugs were everywhere. It was uh, just a blizzard of, you know, I, I'd seen the kind of ecstasy thing going on late 80s and early 90s. And then there just seemed to be a blizzard of cocaine and then people going on to heroin and stuff. You know, it was and uh, in the top 10, you've got Born Slippy by Underworld, which I think I've, I've never seen the film, but I think it comes out of train spotting. 
and it, it's it's got that kind of druggy thing about it that druggy ambience and also in the top 10 higher state of consciousness by wink who i think was a was a was a and maybe still is a dj uh, and uh, it's just that world that it's a world that means nothing to me of going to a field i, I know, i've never i've never even been to a festival in my life you know i don't want to get my shoes dirty oh you've missed out mate you've yeah, missed it's, out it's, not, it's no. never an ambience it's never an atmosphere that i want to see music you know no well, I, I want, you don't you see it's a different I'm, I'm, i think you might want to hold your judgment back on that one because there'll be many people who've experienced it and said no, it ain't supposed to be like a club it ain't supposed to be like a um, an outdoor festival in your local park. It, it's an experience. And I think when you talk about cultural significance of the charts, remember going out in the middle of the field. My mate, Binzi, he's my lodger actually, is two floors above me as we speak. And he's a gooner, let's leave that aside. What he used to do, imagine this, in the old days, what used to happen with these festivals, Mark, and I apologise if I'm going into territory that you might already know, was that you'd hang around on a Friday night waiting to get some mysterious call from somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody who knew where a rave was going to be in the middle of nowhere in a field. Imagine that. So you're, you're, you're all gathered at one of your mate's houses or flats at uh, three o'clock in the morning and you still don't know what's going to happen empty your Friday night. You still don't know if you've had an absolute nightmare in relying on somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody no, to tell so you you're where basically, the rave is. You're basically saying you didn't have WhatsApp in 1996. How far behind you are there in Blighty? <laughs> <laughs> we would have just well, tweeted, this, our, tweeted this, our friends, you know? This was a little bit before 1996, to be honest. <laughs> well, when I talk about the rave scene, I'm talking about more like 92 two maybe something around that um 1992 but nevertheless it was still going on in 96 and no you're right we didn't have whatsapp and the fun of it whatsapp would have taken half the fun away the fun of it was eventually you get a call and somebody says be at this petrol station on the motorway in half an hour get there as soon as you can so you'll jump in your cars or the car and you race off to this um, petrol station, you just join the end of this queue, which is snaking its way across the trajectory of the United Kingdom to some deserted field in the middle of nowhere that will, will forever be England. And then there's my mate Binzi in one of these reflective, you know, these re yellow reflective vests that they wear. And um, he's standing in the middle of the road and waving cars in to some a uh, random field in the mo middle of nowhere and charging them 10 pounds to park their car. <laughs> and they think because he's got the reflective vest, he's official. And then before you know it- I put up his rent, I put up his rent. Yeah, he's obviously yeah. talented. Yeah, yeah, those are the good old days though. So I, I, was, I, I was looking I at the- you, Go on, Mark. Sorry, can I ask you about the Mecca and Stevenage? Because I've never heard of Stevenage until they got promoted into the Football League. Well, it's a new town. It was a dump of a town. I left uh, my safe, comfortable home in Tottenham. Uh, my bunk bunked off the afternoon from school to get to, because I wanted to get to the Mecca early, you know, because I was like so consumed with all the sort of 50s culture that I, I'd never experienced. So all these old teddy boys came out of the woodwork wearing their drape suits and everything like that and brill creamed hair. So I was there from like about four o'clock and I was like, you know, my eyes were glazing over because there was so much 50s memorabilia in terms of uh, personnel in any case on show. Get into the Stevenage, wasn't it a huge place? It's probably held like about 300, 400 people. It could be more, but it didn't seem like a huge place. And then eventually, with anticipation, the guy that had kicked off the rock and roll revolution, more or less, over here in the UK with one, two, three o'clock, four o'clock rock came on the stage. And it just kind of went wild. You may as well have been at a cinema in Finsbury Park uh, rioting as they were showing Blackboard Jungle 30 years earlier or so. And I remember I was probably the only black person i think i was the only black person let's be honest in the entire venue and i was what right up front. You? what did they make of you um well bill haley noticed me and i <laughs> saw him give me this like look of i know you're there look, I, I'm, not, I'm not gonna i'm not gonna point you out i'm not gonna drag you up on stage to make an issue of it but hey i know you're there 
And um, anyway, I, I missed my last train home. So um, Bill Haley kept coming on for an encore and yet another encore. And he had to play Rock Around the Clock about three times before he went on stage. So, and I told my old man that the concept, because Stevenage was in the middle of nowhere. If you're coming from the inner city, it, it's uh, it's not even a suburban town. It's one of the new towns, kind of like where where Tim comes from. Um, it's, Hemel, exactly, Hemel. it's exactly the same place. It's, it's very it's close. up the road. Yeah, it's up yeah, the road. They, they are, you know, it's kind of 1950s concrete, which seemed like a good idea at the time, but uh, it's, it's kind of falling down. It's a great well, place to be a, a great place to be a kid, not a great place to be an adolescent. And not a great place to be from the inner city uh, ghetto of Tottenham, about 20 miles away, when you've missed your last train. So all I hear as I'm going towards the um, the dual carriageway is the megaphone from the platform saying, last train to Finsbury Park is now departing from platform three. My heart jumped into my mouth because I knew my old man was going to kill me. So I told him that actually the concert was in Trafalgar Square, you know, somewhere in town that he would know. I missed the last train, started hitchhiking in the middle of the night as a 12 year old or something like that. Got as far as um, Welling Garden City, which was seven miles away. Couldn't get any further. So I went into the local police station <clears throat> To, because I thought in those days that the police were like an Uber service that, you know, when they see a 12 year old kid at two o'clock in the morning, they will drive him home. Well, it didn't turn out to be like that because they said, right, what's your parents number? And I thought, I'm not going to give him my parents number. My old man will kill me. One thing going out to Stevenage to see some bloke called Bill Haley. Another thing missing your train. A third thing that the cop calls you up at two o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning, whatever it is, and wakes you up. So I just give them my mate Hadge's parents' phone number because I know they sleep like a log. They're Greeks, you know, he's my best friend. So I gave them his phone, his parents' phone number. And like I said, they slept like a log. So the cops kept calling them and calling them and calling them. Nobody answered. And then that's when I realized that the cops were even cleverer than I was, because what they did was send a policeman from the local police station, which was St. Anne's Road Police Station, which was only about half a mile from where my mate had his parents live. And they went round and knocked on their door. So they kept banging out in the middle of the night, banging on the door till they finally woke up. And they say to my, my friend's old man, we've got your son at a wedding garden, Nick. And he was like, no, you haven't. My, my son's upstairs asleep. And they said, no, 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 he's at wedding. You think he's upstairs asleep. He's actually at wedding garden, Nick. And the bloke says, he's not at wedding. So he says, look, just go up and look and you'll see. Go up to your son's bedroom. He goes up to his son's bedroom. And he said, like I told you, my son's fast asleep in bed. So then the cops at wedding garden city get this message. They turn around to me and said, right, you're having a laugh, aren't you? You're having a laugh. You better tell us where you live right now. And when they read the riot act to me, I gave them all the details. My old man woke up and they said, what do you want us to do with him? And my old man said, do whatever you want with him. So they put me in jail. <clears throat> That's the story. As you ask about uh, the Mecca and Stevenage, I hope that answers it. Should we go on to talk about some football? Can we pay tribute to the linesman? What, for the Argentinian goal after three minutes? No, no, for the goal that wins it at the end. And Argentina, as, as, as you rightly point out, take the lead early. It's Crespo setting up Claudio Lopez. Uh, a fantastic goal from, from Baba Yaru. Uh, Equalises for Argentina. Second half, Crespo gets a penalty. It's an equaliser for, for, for Nigeria. And then we're right at the end of the game. So it looks like we're going to go to, to extra time. And Nigeria have a, have a free kick. And the Argentine defence decide to, to, to confront this free kick by coming out to catch the Nigerians offside. And it's a higher risk strategy because you only need one to be a little bit late out and he'll play him onside. And one, I think it was one of the experienced players. One of the, you, you could have three overage players. I think it was a vastly experienced Sensini who was just a little bit late out and the goal is scored. And the line, the, the referee's assistant, the linesman, doesn't flag. Has seen it. We forget sometimes how good these people are. Uh, when when you, you, you look at this from 3rd of August of 1996, you're thinking, if you can make a decision that good, why are we, why are we um, going down the road of VAR? Yeah, OK, so pay tribute to the linesman, Mark. Should we pay tribute to some of the players on both sides? Because it was, it was a... You know, an entertaining game to say the least. We saw some skills, not least in the Nigerian midfield. But Tim's already said that this was a game of uh, attackers 
over defenders and the attackers coming out on top? Well, I mean, you, you didn't really have many defensive-minded players in, in the Nigerian side. Um, that goal that Tim talks about was converted by Amonike. He had a great career at that stage, uh, still playing for Zamalek in Egypt, but they were paying him so well, it wasn't really worth his while to go anywhere else. Uh, eventually had a spell in Barcelona, and you wonder if Amonike could have been a player with a profile of an Eto, for example, or a Drogba mm. in Europe in those days, had he gone to Europe a little bit earlier. Um, and an amazing story about him is, is the way he was discovered in, in Nigeria, in, in Lagos in particular, they often have these um, international tournaments, World Cup tournaments, where you, you, you play for a team, let's say you're, for argument's sake, Malta or Hungary or whatever, you put together a, a side with your mates and, and down you go and enter your side and, and you take the name of a country and you play these World Cup games. And uh, it was at one of those little tournaments, almost on the side of the road kind of stuff that uh, he was first seen. And he was in the national setup, um, pretty much having played a handful of, properly organized football games in, in local league competition. He really was a phenomenon plucked out of nowhere. One of those classic sort of um, diamonds in the rough story, but a uh, fabulous player. You had Amakachi, of course, the bull from Kaduna who went to play on for Everton. Everton. And, yeah. You know, uh, it was scored some cracking of, goals for Everton yeah. as well. You know, yeah. it's, still, it's, a really, you know, it's a really subtle goal that he scores. He's, he gets the equaliser, doesn't he, for Nigeria? Don't, yeah, don't, don't be deceived by the size of the man. I mean, his upper body strength is absolutely phenomenal, but the delicate touch, you know, the, the footwork, he, you know, he's a magnificent footballer. I'm a catchy. And again, another one, he, he, he got stuck a little bit in Belgium for a while. You know, it was a, he was a big star in Belgium with Bruges. They absolutely love him. He's a club icon there. But had he moved a little bit earlier, had the English League, for example, which was just becoming international in those days, had they realised a little bit earlier, here was a, a potentially cheap buy from Belgium in the way a footballer based in Belgium would be now, uh, I think he would have had a great Premier League career. I mean, he was made for the Premier League, that strength and power. He was brilliant. You know? he was brilliant. And to inform you as well, every time I've met Everton fans and I've said I'm a Nigerian, they immediately say I'm a catchy. So they haven't forgotten him there. But this was a team, as we've already hinted, of stars. Uh, on both sides, I, 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 when you weigh the two sides up, I'm inclined to think, on reflection, uh, Mark and Tim, that Nigeria had the greater number of stars. On reflection, yeah, and 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 in hindsight, and, and yeah, they went on to 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 be big stars. Uh, again, it's a, it's that it's that golden generation, you know, um, that has not been not, not have been uh, that has not been repeated. But the, the Argentinians, to be fair, have had a consistent conveyor belt or a better conveyor belt of talent over the years. Uh, and they had some really good players too, but um, we, yeah, here on this continent, I mean, we all remember that incredibly fondly. Remember, I mean, Africa had won nothing before. Maybe an under seventeen, or you know, we never won an under twenty. An under seventeen, Africa had won, but that's fairly meaningless. So the under twenty three was a virtual national team in, in those days. It was all the top players. It was a very exciting time for world football as well, with the youngsters coming through, and 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 Africa were top of the pile. You can imagine the the euphoria on the continent. But why did it mean so much to other countries, other nationalities on the continent? Because if I think of it in terms of European uh, sides, we, we were never happy that another European team won the World Cup over yeah, South you, America. But, but that's, the difference, that's the difference, is you, is you were winning, you know? You were winning. It was, if, if not you, it's the Germans. If not the Germans, it's the Dutch or the Spanish or the whatever, or the French. In, in Africa, no one was winning, you know, and I think uh, the sense of this is this is our time, these are our people, um, pervades throughout the continent. I think, um, and it's that's still the case, you know. When when I think when Africa sits down at the at the World Cup in Russia in, in twenty eighteen and looks at the looks at the teams, maybe not so much the Arabic speaking sides, the Egypts and the Tunisias, but looks at the Nigeria and the Senegal and the Cameroon. There's a collective will around the whole continent for them to do well. And I think that's that happens every Saturday when, when Africa consumes the the Premier League or La Liga or Bundesliga. They all look, you know, frankly speaking, they look for the black guy on the field, you know, yes. where's he from? And he, you know, uh, he, he's our man. Let's, 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 let's back him up. So what are those from, from the Anglophone, you know, the, 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 the ones that are colonized by England? 
Yeah. Do they, is there a rift between them and the ones who were colonized by France? Yeah. Or, or is there a Pan-African thing? No, in 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 in, in, uh, in competition on the continent, of course, of course. So they you know, um, but but it's it's not that big a deal. It's not a sort of an England English German thing, you know. It's not. It doesn't have the same sort of undertones that that, that rivalry that you have with uh, you know two all two world wars and one world cup. Um, but but collectively, I think um, you know. Guys in Nairobi backing Samuel Eto in a Champions League final, despite he's a you know he can't hardly speak a word of English and he's a you know he's a French French speaking Cameroonian, um, and and the same for Sadio Mane. Thank God his English is a lot better these days. But I mean you know he's he's adopted by everybody. I mean, everybody looks to Sadio Mane to fly the flag for for the African continent. It doesn't matter that he's a French speaker from Senegal. I think that's the, thing that, the thing that's so, always interested me about. Africa. It, it's a question. Not. Start. I've never, never um, set foot on the continent. My brother lived in Tanzania for a while, um, but I never got around to visiting him. The underachievement in recent years, if, if you like, of the African national teams, and the underachievement perhaps of African nations. Certainly, I remember reading stuff in from written in the fifties, and it was it was just assumed that Africa was the new economic powerhouse of the world, and. How much of the underachievement, both on the field and off it, can we put down to the legacy of colonialism in that the borders of the nation states were established by the colonizers? By the Berlin Convention. Yeah, and, but, and not, for, not through any, any local rationale. So you're putting lots of different perhaps antagonistic people with different languages together in what in one nation how much is that as that of those uh lines between the countries the division of the continent no, it's, a, it's the a arbitrary question. division of the continent how much has that held back both football and nations yeah it's a good question and one that i, I would find difficult to answer because i you know i think uh, in, in those places where perhaps uh People wouldn't be compatriots, wouldn't have the same passports, wouldn't have the same nationality, were it not for the colonizers, um, but still play on the same national teams. I don't, I don't think you have uh, you, you have any problems. I mean, Nigeria is probably a, the best example. Probably I was, I was going to say, that is yeah. a perfect example. This 1996 yeah. team is a team of different, if you like, ethnic groups. speaking And religious and groups religion. as well. Indeed, indeed. Speaking different languages, unifying languages, of course, English. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the football is um, any different as a result of, uh, you know, the, the, they're, rep they're representing Nigeria rather than their ethnic groups, yeah. is the point I want to make. You know, it's interesting, though, as Africa is celebrating their mark, and uh, I, I read one article in The Guardian uh, where it's headlined, we ran out of beer on that night. So whilst Africa is celebrating, the opposite, I'm, I'm assuming, is happening in Argentina, they might be celebrating elsewhere in South America, but in Argentina, it'll be time for tears, won't it? And it won't be the first or second or third level tears in terms of coronavirus. It will be proper tears, the way that the uh, the, the the clown used to uh, shed in that tears of a clown. But who are they? How are they explaining how they got beaten by Nigeria? Because Nigeria, Argentina is the hoodoo team for Nigeria generally in the World Cup. They're the ones who always knock Nigeria out. So how are they yeah. explaining this now? Uh, um, there was a fair bit of blame for the, for the, for the linesman, I think. <laughs> Either because that uh, no, was offside, it was offside, or it never should have been a free kick in the, in, in, in the first place. Um, but I don't think there was any, any real talk of underestimating Nigeria because people saw what Nigeria had done to Brazil where the game looked to be done and dusted. I think Brazil were 3-1 up. We're not long to go. Um, and it was, a, it was a dramatic moment where, uh, obviously, Niger Nigeria have to throw caution to the wind, and Brazil have an easy counter-attack. And it's Rivaldo. All he's got to do is play the pass, and he doesn't, and he gets robbed. And, uh, and, and Nigeria go back uh, uh, immediately and score, and that changes the whole dynamic of the game. Rivaldo got crucified for that and didn't play for Brazil for more than a year afterwards he, he he had to he had to serve his 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 penance but it meant that uh argentina knew they were up against the side full of of attacking possibilities but it was a huge disappointment to them because the and i hadn't seen this until 1996 the olympics was all about the football tournament because it's a thing that they do is it's their only chance of winning a medal you know if you look at uh, some south american countries the only medals they've ever won have been at football 
So, um, you know, whereas the Olympics is so different from the World Cup in this respect, isn't it? Because every country sees a different Olympics. Every country sees the same World Cup. It sees it with different commentary, but it sees, sees the same games. The Olympics, you're, you're following, and this is increasingly the case, I think, you're following your own athletes and your own, your own chances of, of the medal. So, you know, to be 2-1 up and seemingly in control and then to lose it was a huge, huge disappointment. However, they were winning Copa Americas. They'd won the Cop America in 1991. They won the Cop America in 1993. They thought they had lots of good players like Ortega and Crespo coming through. So they thought they would be winning future World Cups. And they're still waiting for a senior title. They haven't won a senior title since 1993. That's quite something. Uh, it's quite something, actually, when you think of it on reflection. Well, they uh, have won two Olympic golds. So they, they've, they've, they've done that one, um, beating Nigeria in one of those finals. Is there any essential difference between the approach to a World Cup and the approach to an Olympic gold title? Is there a difference? I mean, obviously, the tournaments are different in structure. I was wondering in the sort of mindset or, or maybe the tactics of teams, is there a difference? There's a difference yeah, in absolutely. the preparation. I, yeah, that's what I was about to say. Sorry, Tim. I, I, definitely in terms of preparation, plus, of course, um, in terms of rules and regulations, you, you don't... Have your players released, uh, first of all, for the Olympics? There's always a big fight. Messi going to the Olympics in, in Beijing, for example, was something that he had to force himself. Um, I'm, I'm straying across your turf yet, Tim. And it, that was a decisive moment because uh, that was the moment with the Beijing Olympics when the clubs won the right not to release the players. So uh, that, that, that has meant... I mean, uh, I was in I was in the the, the Maracanã when Brazil won the, uh, the finally they won Olympic gold in football in um, in 2016 and they're up against Germany and the German side were basically a reserve German under 23 side because that that was all they could get released. Um, so this match, this Olympic final 1996, is far more important than some of the subsequent Olympic finals just because you you are really seeing a halfway house between. The World Cup, you know, on the on the way to to, to the World Cup, uh, and I'm I'm still fascinated by where Nigeria went wrong on the road to to, to 1998, and they lost to Paraguay in a group game that they could lose. Um, I, w I watched that one in in the Africa Centre in London with Nigerians. Oh, wow. Uh, and the, the abuse that they were giving Rufai in goal, you know, oh no, he wasn't popular. But then was it is it was it Denmark that that, that put them out? Yeah, like but they did they did beat Spain with that fabulous Elise goal. They did. Um, I, I've been to the Africa Centre once myself, uh, Dotton, to watch Grover Washington Jr. Well, that's not a bad shout. I think oh. that the uh, team watching it with a few random Nigerians. Mm -hmm. uh, sadly, the Africa Centre is no more. I mean, no. as you imagine where it was in the centre of London, in the most probably valuable, well, one of the most valuable areas in the centre of London. Uh, the property, the building was worth a lot of money. It was held by a trust. Uh, my wife was on the committee of the trust towards the end of it, and she fought gallantly to make sure they didn't sell it, but there was so... <clears throat> Because it was a listed building, it's a, a building from the 18th century, if my mind correct, is correct, uh, it cost a lot of money. The upkeep cost a lot of money. So they had holes in the roof that was like multi-million pound repair jobs. You have to repair them in a certain way to keep with the, t uh, you know, with the, um, the restrictions on the buildings because of uh, their age and so on. And they just couldn't do it. So they sold the building. They've gone and sort of set up an African centre somewhere in South London. It's not the same thing. It's got to be in the centre of town. And remember, this is the Africa centre that hosted some of the greatest names of African politics and Grover Washington Jr. and a few random Nigerians. <laughs> and, um, some, and some bigotry. Well, I forgot about that. But, but not Rufai. <laughs> I don't think he'd be welcome after, after the goals he let in against Paraguay. But you, the, the, we, that game sorry, against... Just very quickly, were you watching it in the basement? Because they had this little restaurant in the basement, didn't they? Where all the sort of old timers used to gather and everything. You could get a decent Nigerian Guinness from there, amongst other things. Was it in the basement you were watching? Yeah, I think it was, yeah. I can still remember the woman I was sitting next to 
uh, when one of the goals went in, she just yelled, and she looked so, so demure. She just yelled, Rufi, you're dead. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Uh, perhaps that was the pressure of, of, of playing for Nigeria in that World Cup where the expectations were so high. But I remember in the Denmark game, it was like Taribo West was strutting around on high heels or something. What went wrong with that team? Yeah, um, I don't know. Um, it 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 really should it really shouldn't have gone uh, pear shaped. Um, the quality was there. Look, they'd had the coaching change. Uh, I, I think um, the, the the personality of Westerhoff was very important at, at, at a stage for for Nigeria. He 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 was very clever in sort of. Um, Having all you know, having all the politicians on side, he certainly made sure the boys all got their money. He was very, he, he was That's very aware important. of all of those kind of problems that uh, Nigerian footballers have to deal with, and he tried to take that off the table as much as he could, you know. Um, so he went and he went and fought for the allowances and all the stuff that was due to them that they weren't getting, and which they still don't get. But but he made sure that his group and in, in the time that he was in charge, and I think that that was a big part of it. So perhaps that kind of that little bit was gone. Um, I think the players had changed a little bit. Uh, you know, they were they were they were bigger individual stars these days. Maybe that sort of uh, collectiveness that came from being underdogs was gone. Um, it's, it's it's hard to say. You know, it's really hard to say. It's it's a good question. I think it's it's some young students going to do a thesis on it someday. And, let, let, let me let me let me float out a theory. Let me run this up your flagpole and see if it fits. Metaphorically speaking, of course. Do you think they might have had more chance of doing better in the World Cup if they'd lost the Olympic final? Ooh. No, I don't think so. I think um, I think they. Uh, I, I I think. By 98, you know, the individualism was perhaps a little bit stronger than it was in 96. The collective had been lost a little bit. You know, remember, African players were just breaking through then. You know, it was uh, it, it was heady days for African football. You know, you guys were beginning to make some serious cash. African players were, were beginning to be looked at by clubs overseas in, 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 the, in, the, in the droves. You know, the George Weirs were arriving on the scene. It's um, no, I don't think so. I, I... I have no sort of um, expertise in all of this, but how I look back on it, and because it hurts me more when Nigeria get knocked out of the World Cup by Argentina, almost in a way, because I think we've taken this Olympic tournament for granted. If you ask any Nigerian football fan, you know, you, you, you can speak to them at a time when Nigerian football is at its lowest ebb and they've just got beaten by England at Wembley again or something like that and they'll say well at least we won the Olympic gold in 1996 it's still a reference point and it's almost you know that it is for players as well if that makes sense that you don't need to win the World Cup They're, everybody wants to win it you don't need it because we've already got our strike you know it's like Sweden getting to the final of a World Cup well, for them, that's that, that's their level. They'll always remember that, 1958. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, which is sad. And also, let's not forget, at, at this point as well, there was, um, there was a little bit of player power. Just going back onto the politics of today, where, uh, again, you know, Nigerian military or police officials are shooting uh, innocent uh, protesters. The Nigerian football team represents possibility. It, 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 it does today, but I think even more so then. You're under a military government in 1996, and the military government that everybody knows is um, brutal, you know, and are fearful of it. The Nigerian, uh, and, and I'm saying this sort of, again, metaphorically, but the Nigerian national team represents hope and possibility despite all the struggles. Everybody knows that we're a wealthy country or should be a wealthy country because we've got lots and lots and lots of oil, but you don't see any of that. What you have over and over again is the political elite exploiting the Nigerian people's wealth. It's so easy to become a multimillionaire in Nigeria if you know the right person and you get a government contract and it gives you lots of oil money, etc. But for 99.999% of the people who whose inheritance this oil is, they never see it. 
So imagine that one moment of joy. I've been in Nigeria during the World Cup against Argentina when we lost in, uh, it was the World Cup in South Africa, wasn't it? Uh, when we lost against Argentina, I've seen what it means to people. We're, what you lose, you lose to Argentina every World Cup, don't you? It pisses me off, Mark, trust <laughs> me. Anyway, um, the, the, since 94, certainly since 94, we've lost to Argentina in every World Cup that we've faced them in. And, but I've seen what it means to people who are watching a, a football match on battered old, you know, what we call a viewing centre in Lagos is some old rickety shed, literally a rickety shed with a corrugated iron roof. And then they would have, some entrepreneur would have installed about four or five of these old style TVs that everybody's thrown out in Europe and every other country. But, you know, old style TVs that weigh a ton with a huge back area. And then they've placed them in vantage points in the shack. And that's what you call a viewing centre and people pay you 50p to come and watch them out. But the communal experience is amazing. That's what that team represented. And it's almost like, yeah, we've done it. For me, that's what, what I think about when I look at that. Not happily, but that, I think that's some of the conclusions I reach in any case. But what a great team. What a great team. And what a great match as well. I'm sorry for Argentina. It's been a pleasure having you with us, Mr. Gleeson. Cheers. Thank you for inviting me. Can we tempt you on again? Yeah, 100%. Okay, and I, I look forward to speaking to you very soon. And, and Tim, uh, commiserations over in Argentina. When you next go to Buenos Aires, tell them that Nigeria is thinking of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was avenged. It was, it was, it was avenged in, 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 every in Beijing. Cup. And every it's avenged World every World Cup. Cup. And it was, it was Maradona's last game for, for Argentina. Um, was it, it was a great game. It was another great game in the 1994 World Cup, where uh, where Maradona. Do you remember the, the 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 quick free kick he took that put Canija through to to oh, score yes. a goal? Yeah. That's it. That was his last game for Argentina because then he he failed the uh, failed the drug test. But he went out on a high because that was a great game as well. So there have been some cracking games down the years between Argentina and Nigeria. Speaking right. I know, that's what I was thinking about, him going out on a high, very metaphorically <laughs> there. Um, high, higher state of consciousness. Uh, high ho silver, uh, yeah. <laughs> high ho silver, do you get it? <laughs> anyway, gosh, why do I bother? Hmm? Uh, what, what, you're what, you're what, wasted on us, aren't you, really? Argentina got the silver medal. Um, <laughs> just one final point as well, just going back to the charts very quickly. We've knocked Wannabe, Mark, Wannabe... Uh, by Spice Girls, but there is a female anthem in the charts as well. It's not unconnected to Wannabe in a way, because, you know, Wannabe is, the idea is that uh, young women claim their rights and, you know, uh, uh, match young men for whatever. They want to be whatever they want to be. At number nine in the charts is Nana Cherry with Woman, oh, which right, yes. shows it's a really important to pitch these two songs together because on the mm, one hand, point. you might think that Wannabe is flippant. On the other hand, when you see Nana Cherry in the same top 10, you've got to ask yourself, well, what's going on there? What's going on is women are dominating the uh, charts because women are buying the records and women are resonating with the messages of the record you look at the other people in the charts like Alanis Morissette is up there amongst some Fuji's arguably is Lauren Hill as Mark said earlier it's not about women low down in the charts you've got uh, Tony Braxton in the charts mm. uh, you've got uh, well a few other women as you go much lower down and I think it's a moment for it, it's not you know it, it's not a um, Emily Pankhurst moment certainly for women but I think you start seeing what you're seeing today in a modern context which is the you know uh, women positive and powerful messages coming through well, it's some, of, some of the ideas of Emily Pankhurst going down to a mass population aren't they yeah, yeah, well, oh, yeah. I would argue it's that. Part, it's part of the same that. movements, but there, there, there is one piece of music which, for me, if you, if, if we, if we, we shut our eyes, it will take yeah. us right back to the 1996 Olympics because you that? just couldn't, you just couldn't get away from it. Hey, Macarena. Oh, for goodness sake. I thought we'd end this <laughs> podcast on a high note. Uh, considering... let's, end it, let's end it on a lower state of consciousness. Yeah, Maradona won't be pleased with that. He wanted to go out with a high, Mark. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And let's reconvene.